I'm Montgomery County Executive Isaac Leggett. I served as a captain in Vietnam in 1968 through 1969. Vietnam was somewhat of an unusual war. Many of the veterans who returned from Vietnam, including myself, were treated without the respect and dignity that we actually deserve. We failed to separate the war from the warrior. This is why I established the Veterans Commission here in Montgomery County in order to restore some of the dignity and respect that our soldiers so richly deserve. I'm proud to present the following documentary that chronicles the experience of just a few of the Montgomery County residents who served in the Vietnam War. Originally, it wasn't thought to last long. It was supposed to stop the spread of communism, but it went on to become the Vietnam War, and it defined a generation. Regardless of their opinions, young Americans were sent off to serve their country. Because of advancements in news reporting, those back home saw images and stories in ways that weren't available during previous wars, fueling an anti-war sentiment never before experienced in the U.S. Over 58,000 American servicemen and women were killed, and more than five times that were wounded. Many were captured or listed as missing in action, and others still remain unaccounted for. By 1975, the war was over, but the conflict was not. Few were initially welcomed back into society, despite answering the call. Forty years later, about 13,000 Vietnam veterans call Montgomery County, Maryland home. Many are still overcoming different challenges as they continue to heal from their experiences. As their lives have continued, their time in war has not been forgotten. These are their chronicles. I uh, grew up in California. I went on to a local junior college for two years and then I, f I transferred uh, to the University of Santa Clara. I graduated in 1960. At that time, I chose to come into the Navy as a cadet aviation officer candidate program for college seniors uh, to, to uh, come in and train as a, as a naval aviator. 1964, the Tonkin Gulf incident was one where North Vietnamese torpedo boats attacked uh, two of our destroyers. The next day, President Johnson ordered retaliatory strikes. I was stationed on the USS Constellation with an A-4 Skyhawk squadron. We were involved in the very first action in Vietnam. Uh, as I was flying very low, almost hitting the treetops, we ran into a lot of heavy fire, and as a result, I was hit. Poof! And everything was like a big white cloud inside the cockpit. And so I keyed the mic and I said, I'm getting out, I'll see you later. Injecting from an airplane at 400 and some knots at sea level, whew, it's, quite a, it's quite a jolt. And another fellow from our ship was shot down. He, he was killed when I ejected and landed right in the water, right in the coast there. Uh, I was immediately surrounded. They put me in a truck and took me to uh, Hanoi, where I became the first resident of this old French-built prison that we later nicknamed uh, the Hanoi Hilton. gave my name and rank and of course they and they asked me other questions I said I cannot answer that why not why can't you tell us I said because as a prisoner of war they said, well there's no war there's no declaration of war you're a criminal you came here and you bombed and you killed our people and I thought uh oh it wasn't more than a week before they showed up in here here was a copy of my hometown newspaper it was a copies of time US News and World Report 
all these ma with my pictures on the cover. Uh, what do I do now? You know, my plans had, were basically all messed up. I mean, here's all this information about me. Some of these cells were no bigger than seven foot by seven foot square, with two concrete beds on sides, so a space that wide in between to walk back and forth. Now, can you imagine two people living in there? I was be in there, the cell, for all day, all night. Well, except for the good 10 minutes that they let me out to wash my clothes and dump out my bucket. My bucket was my bathroom. The paper towels and the paper dispensers you get out of the restroom, two of those. That was our toilet paper for the week. And then you had your little uh, uh, porcelain water jug, and that was, you. they fill that twice a day. So that was your water. They fed us twice a day. In the summer months, it was pumpkin soup. The meat was not in there, it was just the broth. The colder months, uh, it was rice and this plant we called uh, sewer greens. We would go over and dump our waste bucket. And sometimes we'd dump it in a pond. After a while, you would see this little algae floating on the surface. The algae would turn little plants and they would blossom into big leafy plants. You see the peasants go out and they scoop it up, take it to the kitchen, chop it up, boil it, and that was our vegetable with rice. Some of our meager belongings, one of them was very important, was a mosquito net. You know, you hung the mosquito net over, so it, it draped around your, your mat. Part of it was to keep the mosquitoes out. The other part was to keep out the rats and at other camps, rodents, snakes. I mean, they were just all over the place, some of the other camps. They, they're wooden blocks with little grooves to put your ankles in that they could come in and put, put, it, put you in irons. And then they would lock it from the outside so these irons would come down and you could not move your ankles. This is when you were being punished Okay, and you could be that way for weeks, even months, as others were shot down later on in the war and the numbers increased gradually. We had to rely on, a, on, the, on the communication to keep us intact as a coherent unit. We recognized that we were not gonna make it if we didn't. The way we communicated with each other was tapping on the wall of the cells. We would be tap, we had a tap code and we would communicate with each other in the cells. We had been shot down, we were captured, but we were not out of the war. The battle was there. Our motto was that we're gonna come out of there, but we're gonna come out of there with our honor. So our, our motto was return with honor. The camp commander's rule said there was no communication. And if they knew we were communicating, we were quote, severely punished. Yeah, well, they really did. I mean, they were brutal about it. When they pulled you out of your cell and you didn't come back for several days or a week, sometimes you wondered if you're going to ever get back. Uh, and sometimes people didn't come back. Their real goal was to break you. They want propaganda. They want you to write a statement. You resist it. Well, then, you know, you go through the routine of resistance, which could go f to sit there on a stool for days and nights to be, you know, beaten to the point, and they had tricks where they would actually use the rope trick, we called it, to pull uh, pull your sockets out of your arms, okay, your, your, your shoulder. Our objective was that they would just reach the point and give up on you. The hardest part was the mental part, dealing with uh, not only the boredom, but the unknown. I, I, I swear sometimes I, I, I lost my sanity. I was held captive uh, for eight and a half years I prayed a lot, especially when I was first 18 months by myself. The senior ranking officer would send a signal, usually by a tap, and we would all stand, and of course we couldn't say anything out loud, but we'd stand and we'd say the Lord's Prayer. Uh, quietly to ourselves, so it wasn't heard outside, but we were all saying it together. And then we would face east, because that's where home was, the U.S., and we'd stand and put our hands in, over our hearts and say the Pledge of Allegiance. That happened every Sunday morning for all those months and years. When we were released and we came out of there, uh, it was the first time we had ever been out of a camp without being blindfolded, without being handcuffed. 
The plane taxied out, finally got to the other runway and revved up and starts taking off, rolling down. And as it's taken off, the kids were just, the guys were just going wild, yelling. We had a team of doctors all over us. When we got off that plane, they said, oh, you better have a, we're gonna have to, you're gonna have to stick with a bland diet, first of all. I said, oh, I was, I was dying for a steak and eggs and a hot dog. And then here comes the next group of guys, they're coming through and they're walking out with milk. I said, wait a minute. If they can have that, I can't too. Like, the heck with this. I went up and ordered steak, eggs. And the doc said, you can't eat that. You can't. All. Said, yes, I can. <laughs> I, would, I felt like I was let out of a mason jar that had been on the shelf for years. And I was out and I was facing a new world. My emotion was so drained. It was not a big deal for me. I wasn't overjoyed. I was happy to be home. But I also wanted to get on with my life and do something and do, do other things. We were the only good, quote, only good things that come out of the war. The poor kids that went over and fought the war, the 18, 19 year old that came back, took the brunt of the anti-war controversy. They were good guys. They went out, they did their job. I, I lost a brother. He was a young fella, uh, 18 years, 11 months, and 20 days. I put everything into this kid, and when he died, it was just too much for me. I volunteered for the draft, that's what happened. And I didn't have to worry about my life. It would be planned for me. I felt like I belonged in the Army. It gave me a full life, and it gave me a mindset away from what has been plaguing me. My basic training, I went in at Fort Hollaberg, and from there I went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and then advanced infantry training in Fort Gordon, Georgia. Then I reported to the Republic of Vietnam on the 17th day of July, 1969. I went to this big camp where everybody was there. No one knew what to expect. And I recall a soldier doing a traditional thing that I ended up doing. He came up to me and said to me, this watch kept my time, it'll keep yours. And he gave me a watch. It really made me feel like I can make it, you know, because he didn't have to do that. And some of the guys are a little hard on us, you know, and enjoy this now because this is it. You probably won't make it, you know, I thought that was cold hearted. But then a lot of them were really nice and this particular soldier just came with me and picked me. They called out which unit you're going to and I was called out to be in the first cab. Our job was to protect at all costs Saigon and being an air mobile unit, that's what that was all about. UH-1, Huey helicopters, the sound of the rotor, you never forget that sound. They came up with fancier ones as the years went by. Even our gunships were made out like UH-1 helicopters and eventually came up with the Cobras. Looks like a big old shark flying in the sky. Flying, you look, you see the guys beside you and around you. When I first went out, we had what they call a hot LZ, hot landing zone. So you just get out, the man didn't even land. You get to over top of the water. And it, the helicopter banked that way and those guys fall out. When it banked that way, the other guys fall out. You're disoriented, you don't know where to go, so you follow the leader. Our objective was to get to the wood line, which is what we did. And once you get to the wood line, you, you take this deep breath and you feel like, okay, I'm not shot yet, <laughs> I'm still here. And then once you get through that thing where you set up a perimeter, then you realize, okay, I'm really in this thing. I'm no longer at the base camp no more, I'm out here. And that's when the whole reality of it all sets in. My job was to carry an M16, and I carried an M79, a grenade launcher. It uh, shot a 40 millimeter projectile. So I was the man with what they call a thumper. It looks like a little shotgun. I had never had a weapon like that before, so I kind of felt powerful. I felt like I was a part of a unit. And uh, you make friends with guys that, just like you, you're scared to death. We went to the first firefight, and we came out of the helicopter, and I was in the swamp. Not being able to swim, this tall guy grabbed me, and I loved him from that moment on. His name is Howard Chen. We call him Lurch. Anytime you take a break, you get a chance to talk to somebody next to you. The sadness was if they got killed, then you lost a friend. And here you are, a young man from wherever you come from. We're all from different places. This guy's bragging about Alabama like it's heaven on earth. Another guy's talking about California getting back to the surf. 
Some of these are things you never heard of. We realize you're all Americans and no longer are you a particular race, you're a soldier. And it's wonderful to work with different guys because you can know who you can depend on. And that's what I like. I mean, if I'm going to be in a situation, I want certain guys near me. If you're standing in the mess line and going to get chow, you might, somebody might get shot from a sniper. War is instant. It happens instantly. There is no set time. And the few times that you felt ease, it was because of a friend next to you, a warm body next to you, somebody who gave you that assurance it's going to be all right. The two, three, four, five of you, you're all scared to death, but as long as you're together, no worries. October 5th and 6th, it was like a two-day war because we didn't know we had walked into an NBA bunker complex. To see a live bunker and people shooting at you, all the training you had couldn't prepare you for it. It's just that it's so phenomenal, you can't be hysterical. You have to stay focused and do what you're trained to do. Fuzzy was a friend of a, uh, one of our sergeants, Sergeant Murphy. He was the only one that got killed that day. And for him to be so close to me and me see it, I, I just never got over it. I was surprised at how that bothered me all of my life. They had another terrible war November the 4th. I was in the hospital. I got back in the unit about the 8th. When the helicopter land, there was a big old circle where the bulldozer had dug out a hole and they had bodies and they put lime on them. And two men had, each two men had to grab bodies and throw them in. And that's, that's when it really hit home to me. When you're searching a village, you find yourself wanting to be more human than you really are. I mean, you didn't want to shoot everybody because you realize those people are scared like you are. The sadness of it, we'd search a village and walk away and then get shot at and then you turn around and just destroy everybody. That's part of my torment. When you participate in that, you can't say you didn't do it because you, you, you did. And when you see what has been done, that's what haunts you. That's what bothers me to this day, to know that we did everything we could to kill those people. But when we searched, they offered no threat to us. So you still wonder to this day what happened. And after being home all these years and you see these movies, now you understand what happened. The Vietnamese were in among these people, you know, and they were scared too. I shot at the people in front of me. I don't want to claim it. You know, some guys get proud of me. I killed this one. I, for my own sanity, I try not to say that. But I'm almost sure that I'm responsible for somebody dying. Because I sure shot at them. I threw grenades at them. Mm -hmm. I did everything I could to kill him, you know, which I was proud of at that time. But since then, that has caused me a lot of grief because they're human beings. I mean, you know, it wasn't my intention to just try to kill everybody. I was trying to keep them off me. My coming home was wonderful. When I remember the lady coming on the PA system, she says, uh, gentlemen, we are 60 miles out of the coast of California. Welcome home. And when I came home, my whole family was at my mother's house. So I had a lot to go for me. I'm 25, 26 years old. I had a new car, I had a job. I could probably put this war behind me. But there's a lot of little things you bring home from Vietnam that you're not aware of until you start living your life. I mean, I'd like to pretend that none of this existed, but in reality, it does. Wake up in the morning scared to death, sweating. I just figured I had a bad dream. I never associated that with being Vietnam. But I found that sadness would creep up on me a lot of times. For example, I'd be playing uh, music and people would be up there dancing and I'd be crying looking for another record. And I don't know where the sadness came from. And I noticed that I do not go in places and sit with my back to the door. Whenever we go to dinner, I want to see who's coming in the door. Fortunately, I ran into Sandra. A friend of mine brought me here. I met her and we spent three months holding hands sitting at the table a chair between us, and it just worked out. And I gotta say that that's been 18 years ago. I've been married to almost 14 years. Really all right, really all right. I can make it now. As I look back on pictures I have about me in the war, I can see what kind of soldier I was. And all I wanted to do was be a good soldier. That was my whole aim for going in. And I think I achieved that much, I'm proud of that. I've always wanted to be a Marine. And being 17 years old, I went down to the recruiter and he said I couldn't join 
uh, I had to have my parents' signature. So I went down and had my mom and dad come up and sign, and the Marine Corps was, was number one top on my list. I enlisted uh, long before I even got a draft notice. I was so immature anyway, so I really didn't think about Vietnam. I had people say, oh, no way you're going in the Marines, you know. You know, don't you know there's a war going on? And I go, oh, yeah, yeah no, and I'll make it in the Marines. A week after I graduated from Einstein in 1968, I was in Paris Island, South Carolina, Marine Corps boot camp. They stripped us down, shaved our heads, gave us chrome domes and uniforms, and we went through more advanced trainings, um, weaponry and uh, different types of strategies and all the typical war type training. Um, and then came home on leave and, you know, wearing my uniform, I come home and there was no one there. They, all the folks that I used to hang around with were either gone and the other ones had excuses why they didn't want to be with me. And I, you know, and later on I found out it was because I was going to Vietnam and they didn't want anything to do with me. I got to my unit and from there, that's when the war began. So uh, there were no more shooting at targets and the targets were shooting back. It was real, it became real, real quick. It wasn't television anymore. We were on hills, they called them hills. And on the hills, they would have big tents. It's the first time I ever in my life slept, ate, showered, bathroom, drank out of same canteens of all races, creed, all races and religions, all in one place. It was amazing. The bond is there because you know that if anything happens, they're gonna protect you. They've got your back, they've got your six. And even the ones that were more frightened than you were and wasn't let on, we protected each other. It was no more fighting against communism or domino effect. It was to stay alive those 13 months and try and hope everybody else stays alive. And that didn't happen, but you did the best you could. You just, every day, just tried to survive. We would be on the hill maybe a day or two. Then we'd go out and search the area for the enemy. When we went to a village, there were no men. There weren't anybody old enough to hold a weapon. It was either old women or little children. We'd ask them if they'd seen the VC, and they would tell us, you know, yes or no. 99% uh, of the time it was no. If we found a, a cache of rice that was, you know, to feed an army, the villagers didn't have the rice anymore. And if we went out of a village and took fire, we had to come back in and sometimes we had to destroy the village. Sometimes we'd go out for weeks and never see the enemy. They would shoot at us. We wouldn't see them. We'd fire back at them. We might see a couple of blood trails. Hardly ever we'd find any bodies. Didn't realize till later on that they had spider holes and underground tunnels that they would pull the dead and the wounded in so we wouldn't find them. We came upon a tunnel. I was still small to go in and that was pretty tight and scary. I mean, when you walk in there with a flashlight and a 45, and if you run into anybody, they already know it's their home field advantage. They, they know where the tunnels are, how high they are, how low they are. We didn't know. And so I crawled back out and thought I heard somebody in there and we brought the flamethrowers in. And another time, it was the Battle of the Bow Bands. So many NVA, North Vietnamese armies that we had to bring in Puff the Magic Dragon and Spooky, the gunships, they might have lost in the thousands that day and we lost in the 20s or 30s. That was probably the worst, one of the worst battles that I remember. Everything you saw on TV wasn't even close. I have pictures in my mind that, that no one should see. No one should ever have to see. I can't speak for any other branch of the service, but the Marine Corps, you knew you were going to die. That's what you were put there, there for. You're there to absolutely has to be destroyed today. We'll, we'll take care of that. Kilo Company, 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines. My understanding, we had 100% casualties when I served with them for, that, for eight months. 
Everyone was either wounded or killed in one way, shape, or form. July 4th, 1969, we were on patrol in Mortar Alley, and it was early in the morning. I was walking point, boom, boom, boom. I woke up in the hospital, priest, the doctor, and the nurse were standing there, and the first thing they said was, you, you, lost, you lost a leg. So I'm 18, or just turned 19. Who's gonna marry a cripple? Who's gonna hire a cripple? And a country that uh, didn't give a damn. I worked hard to, for 40 years to now where I'm married. I, I got a job, somebody hired me. Uh, Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, I work as a readjustment counseling social worker team leader at the Silver Spring Vet Center. I was working down at the Vietnam Memorial and this guy kept staring at me. He goes, are you Wayne Miller? Were you in Kennedy? I said, yeah. He goes, I was the guy that put you on the helicopter. Our unit's having a reunion here in D.C. And when I walked in the room, they just lost it because they thought I was dead. We did not lose the war in Vietnam. We quit. We quit. I'd have rather lost. I'd have rather been sitting there signing a piece of paper saying we lost the war than to quit. And it just made it so much harder for all those guys that were wounded and killed. You know, Marines never quit. We don't quit anything. We don't even quit the Marine Corps. Even when we're dead, we still have a job. I have to put Vietnam on every morning. I have to put my leg on. And people would ask how I lost my leg, and I, I would say it was a motorcycle accident. Because when I said Vietnam, I had one guy one time tell me, you deserve to lose your leg in Vietnam. But years later, I thought about that. And in a way, he was right. I mean, he was right, because if I hadn't have lost my leg, I would not have been able to help all those other folks who have lost limbs, who have lost loved ones, who have, who have been affected by the war and, and just not making it yet. And if I can make it and show one person, then yeah, I did deserve it. How'd you lose your leg? I didn't lose it. It was blown off in Vietnam. I went over and served my country, and this is the result of what war is. I wouldn't change anything. I'd do it all over again. I served as an Army nurse um, in Vietnam at the 95th Evacuation Hospital. At that time, there was a lot of demonstration going on, you know, against the war. In the flower children, there was the draft, and the guys had to go into the military. I graduated from high school in 66 and then went to nursing school in Boston. And in 68, 67, 68, I was coming home to a funeral every six months. And I remember standing at the cemetery and I said, I've got to do something. I went back to Boston and found myself an army recruiter and walked in and said, I want to join the army to be an army nurse. I spent 10 months working in the recovery room, intensive care unit here at Walter Reed. And now I get this phone call. You're going to Vietnam. What do you do as a 22-year-old woman, young woman, to pack a duffel bag to go to war when there are no shopping malls and you have to pack for a year? Everybody else is like having this normal life and I've got to go off to war, whatever that is. So anyway, I got up there to Da Nang, and then they got me to uh, the hospital, and re I reported to the chief nurse there for duty. And I remember her saying to me, oh, I didn't know you were coming. What am I going to do with you? So that was my welcome to Vietnam. I worked in the triage area, which we called pre-op and receiving, pre-operative area and receiving. Receiving meaning we were receiving the wounded from the helicopter pad. And I've got a young guy there waiting to go to the OR. He's laying in the bed and he says to me, I can't feel my leg. And I say to him, 
it's gone. And you know, as a nurse, you, you, you're not prepared for that. We don't do that. Doctors tell patients that. But I was all he had. At night, I had to stay awake. You know, nurses never sleep. And I'd have to listen for choppers. Even to this day, I saw a chopper the other day and hearing that familiar sound, it brings me right back. There really wasn't an obvious reason for why we were there. I found out that the soldiers that I would ask, they were young, you know, 18, 19 years old. They didn't know why. They were ordered over there, and their only goal was to get back home alive. And when I talked to the people, and I met, you know, I had some friends, a Vietnamese nurse that was a good friend of mine, and they didn't understand this war. It had been going on for so many years. So anyway, I go down to start working in the pre-op and receiving area, and I meet Chrissy and Annie, who ended up my best friends, even still, you know. We were all lieutenants, <laughs> less than a year experience over there in the middle of this war. But we, were the, we took care of the patients. We taught each other. Chrissy was amazing. When she worked nights, I could tell when we had casualties, I would come in in the morning and there would be a few more flowers drawn on the wall. That's how she dealt with her loss and grief and seeing these atrocities. I saw a lot of death and devastation. I don't know if you've heard of expectant patients. Those are the patients that, that are expected to die. The only time in my experience that that happened was with the head wounds. So the neurosurgeon would assess the head wound patients and decide if there was no hope. And if there wasn't, then that patient would come over to the pre-op area and I would sit with them. And I'd put a screen up and sit with them until he died. I think that looking back on it, I had some defense mechanisms to cope. I didn't, I, I, I think like I don't remember one name of anybody that I took care of. We heard that there was someone coming in, a nurse, Sarah, who had worked in an ER before. And we were all excited because none of us had ever worked ER, and here we are, running the ER. So Sarah started working with us, and she only lasted a month or two. She couldn't. She, she got very nervous, migraine headaches, and Within a couple of months, she was met back back home. Even over there, you, you talk about going home, but you never really, it was almost like you never really believed you were ever going to go home again. You know, the politics of it, that we supposedly weren't in Laos. We weren't in Laos. And I remember one night getting mass cash and, and, you, and they'd come in on a schnook. So a schnook helicopter is not a Huey, it's a big helicopter that can carry like up to 25 wounded and you know several stretchers and so we got all these wounded in and and I remember asking one young fellow um, where were you injured because that was a question the doc would ask or I would ask and and he, him saying to me, you know, this young 18-year-old would say, is this when I tell you the truth or what I'm supposed to tell you? <laughs> so obviously they were in Laos. It's interesting, isn't it? Where does the truth begin and the politics end? My friend Chrissy is from California. You know, when she came home, she ended up in California. And she was approached by several producers, um, TV show producers, and one of them was from China Beach. And I don't know if you've seen the show, but 
Each episode is based on a story, a real story from a nurse. Chris helped with the, with the stories there, and she told me it was too painful to, for her to talk about her own story, so she told my story. <laughs> So I guess uh, the, the part of the, some of the stories there for um, that nurse, McMurphy, was based on the stories about me. And China Beach was reality for us because remember we were in Da Nang and that's what China Beach was. And on our days off, we would go to China Beach to swim. For us, China Beach was absolutely a reality. That was, that was our R&R &R right there in country. Here I was in Vietnam, and I applied to two universities while I was there. I, I got into those two universities, and I put my paperwork in to get this drop. And I didn't hear anything, and I didn't hear anything. And I talked to the, my new head nurse about this, who was very mean. And she said, oh, you don't need to do that. I didn't go back to school till I was 42. So I thought, OK, what do I do? And I thought, well, I could write to my senator. I could write to Ted Kennedy. I knew as an officer in the military, you don't write to your senators. This is not something you do. But I decided it was worth it to me. And six days later, that chief nurse comes running down. I'm working on a Sunday, I remember, running in the hall and says, McCarthy, go pack your bags. You're out of here. I didn't even have any written orders or anything. And she said, you go pack your bags and go to the airport and you're out of here. So that was my goodbye out of Vietnam. In 10 days, I was back, I was in college, which is what I wanted. You know, I had signed up for the GI Bill, and then I got a job in the emergency room of their city hospital, part-time job, and I was going to school full-time. But within a few days, it, it hit me. I, it was a very, very, very dark time. It was harder coming back from Vietnam than it was going to Vietnam. You know, when I came back from Vietnam, it was like, what do you do after this? Life was very anticlimactic. Now, Indianapolis, I wasn't really fitting in in Indianapolis. Um, I remember working in that ER and I was helping a surgeon, oral surgeon, suture up somebody's face. And I said to him, he was across from me, you know, and I said, I can help you with that. And he said, why? How do you know how to do this? And I said, well, I did this all the time in Vietnam. And he stopped and he looked at me and he said, I've never been out of the state of Indiana. I was looking around and it seemed like people were just going on with their lives. And it was like, don't they realize that there are still people being killed in Vietnam? There's this war going on and nobody's paying any attention to this. Chris died a couple of years ago, my friend Chris. She had a weird leukemia that they think is connected to our exposure to Agent Orange. That was a tremendous loss. She came here for the dedication of the Vietnam Women's Memorial, and we were part of that whole parade. And the soldiers would yell out, I, I think you took care of me. I was drafted in 1968 on the 17th of July, and that was my birthday. It was my 21st birthday. You swore in that your, your oath to the United States of America, that you'd be a good citizen and do your duty. And then you stood in a line, like the 70 guys that were there the day I was there. And they literally went, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Marine. You, they picked the Marines, you didn't, that was the drafted Marines. I luckily was not that guy. Didn't want to go in the Marines. Army, I didn't want to go anywhere. I wanted to go in Navy, but they didn't do Navy. Okay. 
early in the morning that bus gets there, we're tired. Nobody slept well in that bus. You know you're going to basic training, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. The, the initial, you know, take your fingerprints. Then they took all our bags. What size foot do you have? Oh, I think I'm 12. Bang, here. Haircut, psh, bald. That all happened between the time we got there and like seven o'clock in the morning. I mean, psh, psh, psh. But I got my leave time at home over the Christmas break and I literally left. My parents took me to Dulles Airport. I got to Vietnam on like the 3rd of January of 1969. Coming off the plane, there's this group of guys passing us, getting on the plane with the big smiles on their faces and the look like, oh, you poor guys. And we get there, we get inside the, the bunkered area, and what do we hear? Boom, boom, boom. Rockets going off. Not too close to us, but we get, got to this place. And uh, of course, you're waiting there for orders because they're going to divide you up. And I ended up in Company C, 4th of the 3rd, 11th Infantry. I mean, we were at Quang Nai. River Basin, Quang Nai, rice patties, getting into our little trouble. First time out, they flew me out on a helicopter with two other guys. There were three of us on the helicopter going out. I'm the only one who came home. Hurley was in my platoon. He stepped on a booby trap and was blown sky high. I was the last person to see him alive that was in his unit. I was sent to the 27th evacuation hospital. I knew that he had a wife at home. I knew that she was like seven, seven and a half months pregnant. I knew that. But he said to me, I'm not going to go home like this. I'm not going to go home like this. And, and there was no, nothing more to say. I said, okay. And I went out. And I went back to my unit. And Three days later, I found out that he died on the airplane going to Japan. So he was right. He's the one I get most emotional over because I made a friend and he was gone. After that, I didn't make a lot of friends in the bush. I started out as just a gunner, just carrying an M16. I went from there to becoming a machine gunner, which I didn't like. You know, and then I was, you know, I was wounded. I caught a piece of shrap metal. We were out on a mission and, and uh, it just cut me. And I ended up with like three stitches in my neck. That was not so bad. When I got back after the wound, back to Lieutenant Pinsensham, who was a, a, my platoon leader, carrying his radio, the platoon radio. And what I liked the best was I was in communication. Now everybody said, no, you're in communication, but you're also a target because the enemy's going to be shooting at you because they want to take out the communication. And I said, oh, yeah, but I like this. And it got to the 17th of July and we were on a mission. It was my birthday and I'm freaked out a little bit by that. We actually got into an ambush and got ambushed. My platoon, we got up on this mountainside and I had been trained on the radio to call in artillery fire. We finally got out of the situation anyway. And on the radio comes across as this ends, line number 151, because he wouldn't call you by your name over the radio. Call line number 151. As soon as you get back to the perimeter, take your stuff and report. There's a helicopter coming in. You're going to get on the helicopter. I, line number 151. I went, line number 151, that's me. Why me? He said, because you've got the right amount of time left in country. They want somebody with the amount of time you have left in country. AmeriCal Division Headquarters. You're going to be the protocol driver for the chief of staff of the division. People fly into the airport, you're going to go pick them up in this nice Jeep, and you're going to come back and you're going to bring them to the back to there was a hotel there. What did happen later, General Edwin L. Powell, he's the general in Vietnam that flew his own helicopter. He says to me, I get called into the general, would you like to be my driver? I said, yes, sir. Still in the same place, but now I'm not a protocol, I'm now driving for a general. General Powell says to me, uh, if you stay in Vietnam until I go home, General Powell's going home, I'll get you a job at the Pentagon. And I said, well, if I go back to the Pentagon, will I be driving for you specifically? He said, no. He said, you'll be in a general pool of drivers at the Pentagon. And I said, no, sir, I'm going back to Maryland. I'm going back to college. And that's what I did. came home in my uniform and was back from Vietnam. All the neighbors were in my front yard. Welcome home, Stephen, welcome home. All I wanted to do 
was go into the basement and hide. I was standoffish to people for a long time. I, within months, as soon as I could, I grew a beard and I uh, became more or less a hippie. And I'm not really inside a hippie, but I had the hippie look because I wanted to fit in. I enrolled at Montgomery College. I actually came back and enrolled. I had enrolled where I had been before. By 1970, I came in and never left. I went basically from being a, a, a sound guy to being a lighting person. And then from being the lighting person, I ran many lights in this facility we're recording in, lighting person to becoming the theater shop foreman. I had gone through the really dark days. I mean, I wear a number of things. I did, yeah. I haven't talked about the having to shoot at people, kill people, that, yes, that was there. And I will tell you that the, there is a veteran center in Montgomery County that opened down in Forest Glen near the old castle. And they do great work. I can't say enough good things about those people. I was a uh, Spec 4 boat operator out of the port of Vung Tau. We arrived in April of 1967 and came home in April of 1968, so I got to be there for the famous Tet of 68. Uh, previous to getting that draft card, I had actually considered going to Canada, just avoiding the whole thing. I told my father that probably uh, trying to start something, being an 18-year-old kid, and he surprised me. And he looked at me and said, I understand. Well, I didn't do it. I would not run from that responsibility once it was in my hand. So I decided I would go and, and make the best of it. We got shipped to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. We all got our orders for AIT, Advanced Individual Training, and mine was to Fort Eustis, Virginia, training to be a boat operator. We spent a lot of time on the water. In fact, as Army sailors, we did lots of our training uh, over at Norfolk. Of course, being guys in green, we took a lot of, a lot of heat from the sailors, but that's okay. When, when we landed at Tonsonut, which was the air base not far from Saigon, there was a firefight going on on the airfield. 40 or 50 yards away, I'm sure, a bunch of uh, GIs running across the airfield, tracers flying everywhere and some lieutenant met us, and he just was not the least bit concerned. We said, well, what, about, what about all that? And he said, oh, that's, that's over there. Don't worry about it. We ended up 100 miles south of Saigon in a port area that was called Vung Tau. We were assigned to a huge barge. And most people think that that thing that goes down the Mississippi River being pushed by a tugboat is a barge. That's not, that's a scow. A barge looks exactly like a seagoing vessel, looks like a boat. The only difference is it isn't self-propelled. We got assigned to a new company that was a transportation company and we were all assigned to various, uh, actually, scows. And we were uh, transported up and down the river the one I was on happened to be refrigerated. So we were taking perishable goods and we would tow additional scows filled with thousand pound bombs. You hear this all the time about war, of mind numbing boredom, interspersed with brief uh, periods of extreme activity. We, we would take uh, ground fire from the shore. They'd occasionally shoot rockets at us. We used to lie on the deck of the, of the, of the boat and shoot back at nothing. And eventually we quit even doing that because it seemed just so useless to be firing in the jungle. And when the firing would start, we'd, we'd go below because they weren't shooting below the waterline and our, our quarters, such as they were, were below the waterline on these things. Tet was the Lunar New Year and its date changes a little bit every year depending on the, on the full moon. 
and a big truce was called because it's a holiday there. And so everybody relaxed a bit. And you could do some other things and the truce was violated repeatedly by, by the Viet Cong. We say that we won every battle and I suspect that's true. They also demonstrated they could go anywhere they wanted and be anywhere they wanted at any time they wanted. I got orders to leave a full week before I expected to go. And so it strikes me as very odd that I got this opportunity to get out and these other guys didn't. On the day I left my base camp, it was hit by an attack and I was told at the time five guys I'd been with that day were dead. I later discovered by visiting the wall that it was actually only four. And I carried those four names around with me for years. And you, you ask yourself many times over the course of your life, why did this happen? Why did I get to go? And these guys stayed behind and ended up paying the ultimate price. When I first got home, I tried to just forget everything that had happened. I collected the uniforms, I collected uh, anything, any paraphernalia that I had left from my service and I destroyed it all. My mother had saved every letter that I had written and I went and found them and I destroyed them. Uh, an act I greatly regret today. I, I would love to see what I was thinking at that time, whether it was true or not, you know. One of the things I did was get married. Um, way too quickly, I think. And it's just recently at one of the PTSD groups I was, <laughs> I mean, we got discussing something about, you know, there's a, there's, there's kind of a profile of Vietnam vets who are not very good at some things and one of them is marriage. <laughs> and uh, I remember somebody saying something and looking up and saying, dear God, it wasn't all her fault. One of the things the Army taught me was that if I wanted more control over my own life, I had to know more. Or I at least had to have the pieces of paper that said I knew more. So I decided I would go to college. I would get more education, the first in my family ever. And I cleared post and made it out in time to start Montgomery College in uh, 1968. It was hard to make the adjustment. People wouldn't stand in line with me because I was clearly military. Even though I was in civilian clothes, I still had the high and tight haircuts. And, people would actually say, I'm not standing as a soldier. So I get through the whole registration process and I, and I go up and I turn in my papers and the lady behind the desk says, oh, you're not 21. And I wasn't. You'll have to have your mom and dad sign this. And I said, really? I said, I just came back from Nam. I think I can, no, 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 no. And, okay, well, it's not her fault, she's fault. So I slid the papers over to the next window, wrote my mother's name across the bottom, slid them back over and handed them to her, and she took them. <laughs> so that, that, that was covered. After I graduated from college, I started working for Montgomery County Public Schools in their school for emotionally disturbed adolescents. It was a very intense, occasionally violent kind of place. And I, I was known as the guy who brought calm to chaos. And people would say, other staff members, how do you do that? How, do you do, how can you walk in and do that? And I would say, nobody's shooting at me. This is not numb. This is nothing, folks. The project started as a book project. I wanted to take a picture of each of the 50 official state memorials and make a book out of it. Many states, like Pennsylvania, don't have an official memorial. But they have a beautiful memorial in Philadelphia, and they have a beautiful memorial in Pittsburgh, and they have a beautiful memorial in 50 other places. Now I've visited probably 500 of them. Finally, my son said, hey dad, how about I build the site, and all you'll have to do is dump in the text. Eh, okay, I can do that. So he built this nice site, and eventually I decided it wasn't fair to be shipping the photos to him to edit and then shipped back to me, so I started doing all of that too. After I made the first post, the first person I heard from was my brother. He said more to me in that email than we'd probably said in person for years and years and years. I was, I was so happy. And 10 days later, he died. 
I've heard from people from, I think the last count was 48 countries around the world who have checked into the site. I hear from vets on a pretty regular basis saying something as simple as, thank you, I didn't know this was there. I'm not one to go out and say, hey, I'm a Vietnam vet, and because of the way I think we were treated when we came home. But if somebody asks me, I'll tell them some of my story. I was the first lieutenant in the Army, in the infantry, and I was in Vietnam from November 68 to May of 69. I graduated from junior college in whenever, May of 1966. Had applied to four-year schools, my grades were not the best, so I didn't get accepted. And so I pretty much expected to be drafted. And that's what happened. I was 19, I was a kid, and expected changes to happen in my life, and they did. I felt, I think, more prepared than some of the guys that who were in my platoon. We had training while I was in OCS and also training in the 82nd Airborne Division in North Carolina. I felt as prepared as I could be. Still, I knew I was going over a green kid with a little bit of responsibility as a young lieutenant. I went and talked to my NCOs in my company and said, hey, I, I've got a little bit of responsibility, but you guys have been here longer. You've got to train me. I think I was open enough to let them know I wasn't coming in thinking I knew the, knew everything. So I think that went over well with both my NCOs and the guys in the, the PFCs. I served in the Central Highlands in Pleiku, is where the 4th Infantry Division headquarters was, and it really was a mountainous area. Fortunately, I was there in a time that wasn't the rainy season. It was hot during the days, cold at night. I was surprised at the, the temperature change. I expected Vietnam to be a total jungle with high humidity, and that wasn't the case in the Central Highlands. When I got out to the field, we'd live in bunkers, hole in the ground, sandbags for a wall, and then logs going across the hole, it might be 10 feet square, and then we'd have that as a roof, and then put sandbags on top of the, that and we'd set up these bunkers if we were going to stay in a position for a week or two. When we were set up in one particular area for a length of time, we'd send out two platoons, north and south or east and west, to go out and see if we could not necessarily make contact with the, we were fighting the North Vietnamese Army, but just reconnoiter. Might have had 30 men in the platoon, so I think we'd generally keep one squad back in the base camp and the other guys would go out and set up observation posts. We were aware of the possibility that we would be attacked, whether a ground attack or a mortar attack. I guess I wasn't particularly fearful every minute of the day, but we knew we could wake up and this might be our last day living, or our last day with an arm or a leg. Some guys I know said they really didn't expect to come home. They didn't expect to survive. Me being a lieutenant, I had the responsibility of ideally helping these guys get home, making sure they came home. It was probably midnight by the time I was ready to hit the, the rack. Was in the bunk at 10 or 15 minutes, and all of a sudden all hell broke loose. Somehow, the North Vietnamese got inside our perimeter. When we heard the explosion from the opposite side of the perimeter. I talked to my man Garcia and I said, my platoon sergeant, we gotta get out of here. I was edging, edging along the, the wall of the bunker. The North Vietnamese saw me moving along through a, a homemade grenade and evidently it bounced into the sandbags and then ricocheted into my leg because most of where I was hit was the right front of my leg. I hollered at Garcia and said, I've been hit. So he came out, 
and helped me to the perimeter, to a foxhole, and bandaged me up as best we could. But I was afraid I was going to bleed to death. I had no, no inkling at the time how badly I was hit. In the morning, we determined that we had killed 25 or 30 North Vietnamese. I don't know how many were wounded. We had lost 25 or 30 of our men killed, maybe that many wounded as well. I was one of the least badly wounded. And when the helicopters came in to medevac these guys out, I was able to help get a couple of guys on the, the helicopter. And I was on the last helicopter to leave the perimeter. And all of a sudden, even over the, the noise of the helicopter, we could hear the thump, thump, thump of a mortar coming from the tree line off to our left. All of a sudden, these three rounds landed right in front of the helicopter. And the pilot hollered to the door gunner crew chief who was on the ground, hop in, we're out of here. So the helicopter came up and away and this poor door gunner <laughs> reached into the, the uh, helicopter and myself and another guy grabbed onto his arms and he was hanging on for dear life with us and I, I'm quite sure his feet were on the skids of the, the bird and when it leveled off he was able to scramble in. I was in the hospital, I guess, probably a MASH unit in Vietnam. They stabilized me and then sent me to the hospital in Japan where they operated on me. I had, um, I think it was 85 stitches. I was in the hospital several days and they were setting up a, a bed next to me for somebody who needed traction. And when that guy came in, it turned out to be one of the other lieutenants from my company. And he said a couple of days after we were overrun by the North Vietnamese, the company was out on patrol again. They were ambushed and the company commander was killed. Three or four other guys were killed and a number of them were wounded. He told me that a couple of guys in my platoon had been wounded. I don't remember whether he said any was, anybody was killed, but I think that's when I, I didn't know who I could write to back in the boonies. And I didn't. I could have written to somebody in the headquarters company, but I, I put it out of sight, out of mind. And um, all these years I haven't contacted anybody with whom I served. Somebody saw that I had been a heroic person the, the night that I got wounded and the next day. I felt I was just doing my job as best I could. I was just shocked. I had, I didn't realize <laughs> what an honor it was. The award, it's the third highest military award given. In retrospect, I have to say that I have accepted the Silver Star in honor of all those the guys, both in my, in my platoon company, I have talked to people and I've heard other stories of guys coming home, getting off the, the plane and coming through the airport with their uniforms on and being spit upon by civilians. Fortunately, I didn't go through that. To me, it was good to be home. Some people I know, it was less than a week from the time they were out in the field or in somewhere in Vietnam, came home and they're thrown out into civilian life. And at that time in the 60s, we did not have any kind of stopgap, any kind of training, any kind of counseling. A lot of people just developed PTSD and it was before the term was used. And they were just angry, didn't know why they were angry. I just, I did not follow what was going on. I came home and pretty much just wanted to forget what I had gone through. Three years ago, three and a half years ago now, I decided I should deal with PTSD. I feel there are different levels of PTSD and I, I think I was not hit by a real bad case of it. But thinking about the guys I lost who were killed, I have to say that's history, that's a memory. I'm not in harm's way. My counselor says to ground myself. Okay, put my feet on the ground, say, my name's Bill Gray, What? what the day is, the time is, what I'm doing. 
what I'm thinking about is a, a memory and it's not going to hurt me. 35 years later, I met a guy who was turned out to be the president of our local Vietnam Vets of America chapter. And he said, one of the things we do is wash the Vietnam veterans wall. I had been down there a number of times, used it as a whaling wall, and it just never dawned on me, hey, I'm a Vietnam vet. I should be down here washing the wall too. When I was in Vietnam, a mortar round came in and hit a bunker, and three of my guys were killed. And the names are John Montgomery, Ed Morrill, and Gene White. Six years ago, NBC did a, a program about our Vietnam Veterans of America chapter washing the wall. And I mentioned these guys' names and the families of John Montgomery and Gene White saw the, saw the show <laughs> and they contacted Bob Dotson at NBC to contact me. <clears throat> I talked with the families and Uh, Linda Montgomery Bailey, she said that 40 years later, I gave, 40 years later I gave John a voice and he was 19 when he got killed, Jean was 22 and Ed Morrill was 19 or 20. I don't think of them all the time, and I don't tear up all the time, but it's there. On October 24, 2015, Montgomery County, Maryland, held an official ceremony honoring the service of its roughly 13,000 Vietnam veterans. Many gathered around a Huey helicopter flown in from nearby Andrews Air Force Base. The aircraft, iconic to the war, served as a place where memories could be recalled and shared with fellow servicemen and women and their families. Hundreds were in attendance as retired CBS news anchor Bob Schieffer hosted a ceremony that recognized and gave tribute to the sacrifices made by those who served. An event commemorating the 40th anniversary of the end of the war did not see the end of emotions tied to it. Almost four months later, former prisoner of war Fred Cherry, who was honored at the event, passed away. Every day that goes by is one further from the Vietnam War and one less to honor and show gratitude to those who served. Thank you.